Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare Podcast. Uh, we're between magazines this month, so we are talking about one of our, um, well, an, another in-between topic, as we call them. And we've been suggested we talk about the big developments or the big discoveries of the last 15 or 20 years, what has really changed our view about anything in ancient warfare. And uh, I suggest that what we do is we just... Um, I'll just give everyone on the team a couple of minutes to to uh, pitch their biggest discovery, and then we can all pile on and see if they survive, and then go on to the next one until we all cry in a corner. Um, who would like to start after this roaring introduction? That's gonna be. I'll just go for Murray because he's always ready to go anyway. I think that the the fact is that I think for ancient warfare there have been lots of finds, obviously that are revolutionary in the last fifteen years. Um, probably for me, my favourite one would be the discovery of a, uh, a ship ruin that proves Herodotus right yet again, uh, which, which again is a bit of a trope that Herodotus makes all these claims, gets poo-pooed for centuries, millennia, and then someone finds something that proves, oh, actually, he may have been correct. Oh, wow. Who knew? Well, it's like, well, yeah, when are we going to learn that lesson? Um, so that idea of well, exactly. And I think the, the interesting thing for that is, of course, that uh, that always should change the thinking on what Herodotus tells us, the, the, the reasoning he gives us, uh, the technology involved and what that meant for, in that case, naval shipbuilding. Um, and I think that those sorts of, yeah, so it's interesting because it's, there's not, to me, there's not been a game changer. Um, there's been incremental adjustments um, and I wonder whether we're almost at a point where game-changing discoveries are, yeah, I, you know, of course, when when they find, um, if they find uh, Cleopatra's uh, grave or Alexander's grave or Attila's grave or Attila's capital city, those might be game changers. But we can find those every two years. I know exactly right, but they still haven't been a game changer yet. But um, I think that there's those incremental ones, and I think the interesting thing is that the game changery things are in fact approaches rather than discoveries. So you'll every now and then you'll get a face of battle, which is obviously 1979 uh, or 76, I think the original edition. Um, so, so those sorts of things come along and change the way we think about. So their approaches, you know, they've, I think the use of the internet over the last 20 years has really changed the way all disciplines, but ancient military history too, are performed. Um, because your access to material is is completely uh, revolutionised. You can do it from your home. You don't have to go to a library. You don't have to, you know, access all this stuff uh, in a way that it wasn't 15, 20 years ago. Um, and then, of course, there are theoretical approaches of, you know, you need to look at it this way, and we'll probably talk about some theoretical approaches which have attempted to be game changers. And I think the interesting thing about a lot of them is that they're, they are modern lenses through which to to view the ancient world and they are trends as in in 15 years there'll be another lens which obliterates the, the lens which now seems to be the way to look at the ancient world you know if you look back and look at you know a marxist way of looking at the ancient world that was all the rage in the 1930s to 50s rostotsev and all of those and then it's gone you, we don't look at it in that way anymore or if you do you're you're accused of being a Marxist once again. Um, and so I think in those ways, a lot of them are not the core of ancient military history. They are trendy ways, you know, and, and obliterating or attacking orthodoxy is, is it yet again something that people, you know, even to the point that they don't like talking about heresy and orthodoxy anymore. Uh, but that's still the pattern that the, the accepted view is now being attacked by this new view and the new view is attempting to supplant it as the new orthodoxy, only to be attacked by another heresy to supplant it as the new orthodoxy. So uh, I think ancient military, I'm gonna get all, all, all literary on you. Ancient military history to me is the big ship in the middle of all that, that basically withstands all of these waves attacking it from, no, this is the way we need to look at it. No, this is the way we need to look at it. And it just sort of sits there and gets looked at in various different ways and it survives like a great piece of art it can survive there are various different interpretations um and some of the, the 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 approaches that we'll talk about to me are utterly unconvincing but they are 
adopted by a new sort of chorus of, of what's the word disciples as like this is the way forward it's like no it's not but anyway i can't you know i won't i won't say that out loud but anyway uh so to me um you know it's it's my favorite are the things that prove herodotus right but i think it's the the fact that we can all be much more expert through the uses of the internet uh that's really changed things in the last 15 years Oh, well, that's probably the biggest discovery the big of LA. 40 it's years. It's not all bad. Yeah. It's not all bad. No, that's true. Well, who would like to provide one of those different lenses or uh, a more concrete example, maybe, of of what's going on? Um, all right, more concrete example. Um, I, I think from an abstract point or from a more generalized point, I think that 15 years ago, when it came to hoplite battle, in classical Greek warfare, Victor Davis Hanson, as a secondary scholar, enjoyed unquestioned primacy. And he didn't enjoy just unquestioned primacy in terms as the voice of the popular literature, right? He, he is an academic, he is a, a member of the academy. He certainly is writing original research, particularly his agricultural research. But in terms of, of, of those academics, like Mary Beard, for example, who speak to the public as popularizers, I think he, his primacy was absolutely unquestioned 15 years ago. Um, and I also, as a, as a young military uh, officer and as an intelligence officer, Hansen was a sign. Like, it was, you didn't get another view, right? You learned Hansen when you studied ancient warfare, period. And that is actually still, I think, the case in, in some circles. I think that Hansen's um, uh, political allegiances uh, caused questioning. And I think that question was going on even beforehand, but there has now been a really popular movement to kind of dethrone him as that voice. And I think it's been largely successful. But the interesting thing is that popular movement has, has both been an, an opposition to Hansen, uh, you know, based, I think, partly on political grounds. But it's also resulted in some really um, smart reexaminings of what uh, of what hoplite warfare might have looked like. And of course, the leader of that, and I've talked about him many times on this show, is uh, Roll, let me do, do this correctly, Roll Kunij Nendike, right? Did I get that right, Jasper? Roll Kunij Nendike? No, Roll Kunij Nendike. Repeat after him, what he said. <laughs> right, Roll Kunij Nendike. Um, but, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, Owen, Owen Wees, right, is the, uh, uh, the other uh, author. And both of them are really reimagining uh, in just the past few years. And I think very, very, um, uh, comp and very compellingly, the nature of the phalanx, whether it existed at all in the form that we believe it existed in, um, why things that we used to take for granted, like the additional depth that the Thebans added, um, or at least credited with adding, what was the purpose of that? And I had never thought that the purpose might be morale. Uh, I had always thought that it had a tactical application like punching power or something until I read them uh, questioning it. So it's just very interesting to me because I really do think that that's a sea change in how we think about one of the most seminal things that started kind of over a political fight, but it's turned into a really research-driven uh, examination of, of how hoplites fought. Um, and then I wanna give one specific example, and I wanna give a very specific example in the weeds example, because it, it speaks to something that I'm guilty of having said in my own writing, which I think I'm wrong. So one of the things I often say in my writing, which I'm gonna stop saying, is that it's very, very difficult for us to reconsider the ancient past because the only thing we can reconsider is our analysis. We're never getting new source material, right? And that's really not true. Um, that's a statement I've made incorrectly in the past. Um, we are finding more material as time goes on. As unlikely as it may be, we are finding it. And the example I wanted to give is this, is the 2014 discovery of yet another late antiquity um, or early medieval, depending on how you count it, Battle of Thermopylae. Um, and it's uh, from the Athenian uh, writer, Dezippus, um, who fought in the battle. And we found fragments, or rather two German scholars found and published fragments in 2014 that were just recent, recently reinterpreted in the last couple of years. That's a whole other battle in that past we had no idea about and didn't discover until 2014. So I wanted to say that both at the macro level in the Hansen example I've given, and in the micro level in, in those examples, it, our understanding of ancient warfare really is changing. Um, and, and I'm incorrect, or what have been incorrect in the past to say that we're not getting new source material because we are. And it's literally the evidence. I mean, we're finding archaeological evidence all the time. And it's, uh, I think it's being 
I think it's being connected to our literary evidence and and reinter or helping reinterpret literary evidence more and more. Or as maybe I don't know, is that is that a trend that twenty thirty years ago that was still considered much more often separately? The historians would look at the texts and uh, and an archaeologist would work on their data and work, work separately. And there's much more integration going on, or is it just wishful thinking? The D. Zippus example I've given uh, is uh, epigraphy. It's writing. It is archaeological, but it's archaeological writing. So I kind of straddle the divide there. On, on that subject, I was going to say it's very interesting because I've been spending a lot of time this this last two years in virtual lockdown, um, listening to lots of wonderful webinars from different archaeological groups around the around the world, and I'm grateful for the fact those people give their time and insights uh, free. I mean, they're just wonderful. Um, and I remember I was listening to one about uh, Sarin, for example. There's a whole lot of uh, sculptures and particularly uh, in engravings that come from there. And, and, and I remember that they were struggling to identify something uh, military. And, and, and the lady said that really wasn't something that, that she knew anything about. And I wrote in the, in the comments, I said, actually, that refers to the, 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 the. And, and, and what it revealed once again to me is the siloed nature of scholarship. And, and I think if nothing else happens, and maybe it's beginning to happen, maybe this is kind of a big thing. Um, it is the f people are looking over their silo walls and saying, actually, if I talk to a epigrapher and somebody who knows about um, you know, bones and things like that, then we, we can get bigger insights about things. Um, uh, and those are important. Uh, uh, the, as, as our own science-based information and interpretation grows, we actually know less and less and less because you have to be a specialist in those things to understand what they mean. And, and I think you mentioned earlier about populists. The great thing that populists bring to this is that they have the ability to bring the high points of those things and humanize them and say, the reason why it's important to study teeth is because it tells us this about diet and age and all that stuff. Um, and I think even the magazine it, in its own way does something like that. It, it brings different strands and puts them in a, in a, in a plate and says, you know what, you know what the, uh, the evidence says this, this is the latest. I think it's important. One of the things for, for me about uh, the, uh, Kinnan and Dyke and Rees model, based on um, Hans van Wees's scholarship before them, uh, is that one of the problems I think with the new approaches, and it's not it's not a new problem. Um, all previous new approaches have poo pooed the previous approach. You know, the the one of the pendulum swings of scholarship that annoys me is the idea that no, all previous interpretations were wrong. This is the right interpretation. And there's sort of a dismissing of of previous scholars and their their knowledge and their their and like Lindsay was saying, the the breadth of their knowledge. When you look at what Momsen was thinking, and what other uh, ancient historians of the the nineteenth century and the you know even Gibbon's knowledge is is amazingly vast. You know we could never recapture the vastness of their knowledge. And even people like Syme and and Eric Gruen and other scholars from the you know Shackleton Bailey, they have so much knowledge that we won't ever even approach. Um, and they combined it all, and they they were up on what was then current archaeological theory and and finds and you know epigraphy and numismatics. And I think. To suddenly come along as a new scholar or a younger scholar and say you're all wrong is incredibly arrogant. But then, the the arrogance of youth is nothing new. Also, rhetoric. I mean, it's well, absolutely. Kind of like, you have absolutely. to distinguish yourself, and often, you know, a lot of our academic research, if you present a change, it's it's all incremental, subtle changes. So you go, that's all wrong. Look at this yeah. tiny thing. Well, but, but, yeah, you know, but, but, you big it up. But you're and you're missing one, and there's one other powerful incentive, Murray, and and then we and it's worth talking about because it is affecting military history, and that is Twitter, right? So both Roll and and again Roll Kinnan and Dyke and and I, and again Owen von Rees, right? Correct. And Rees. Owen Rees. Owen Rees and Hans, Hans von, von Rees. Rees. Right? Hans von Rees. Hans von Rees. Rees just, Owen Rees. And I apologize <laughs> to both of those gentlemen again because I'm <laughs> every time, and I'm furious with myself. It's my fault. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, but look. They do that bad ancient hashtag. They're on Reddit Ask Historians. They're, um, they're, and I am glad of this, by the way. This is not a takedown. They are both doing the popularizing work that I think is so critically important and that I live and breathe for. But Twitter is a platform that incentivizes sensationalism, right? It incentivizes personal brand. It incentivizes inflammatory language. And, and you get immediate rewards. When you say something controversial, you get that Pavlovian feed of likes and retweets. You, and who knows? You might get Mary Beard 
dropping in to, to like your tweet. And isn't that, and that feels amazing, right? So I do think that um, part of that um, bold and, uh, you know, in, um, in, um, bias to action and unseating other theories is kind of driven by the, by the personal branding, self-commoditization and um, excitement culture, um, conf confrontational culture of social media that pervades all scholarship and frankly, all life. Uh, in, in our day and age. So I think that's you know, I, I think that's an excellent point. I think that's also generally a comment on the media because I remember years ago when I was trying to pitch a story for, for one of my books, the journalist basically said, but what's really the new angle? And I said, well, it's the fact that it brings to no, 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 what was the, you know, they have to have in a headline an angle. Of course, I'm the news editor for the magazine, so I also have to look for those things. But it depresses me when I keep seeing that everything is sensational. We'll rewrite history. Everything can't be sensational. Everything can't rewrite history. And the problem is it sets a very high standard for every archaeologist and historian doing genuine, useful work. Because I found a hobnail in a field is spectacular to find, isn't. <laughs> you know, that, that's the word. So that's, I think, all wrapped up in this, this um, need for funding and attention because people's tenureship at universities are all hanging on it and the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't have a solution to it either. But hey, one, one point I wanted to make about what you said, uh, Lindsay, about um, popularizers, you know, uh, being interdisciplinary. Um, I'm, I'm, hope, I'm about to announce, uh, hopefully in the next few days, a new project. Um, and in order to do the um, research for that project, I wound up reaching out to a physical geographer and soil scientist at uh, the uh, Aristotle University in Thessaloniki um, on a particular region in central Greece, which uh, I'll be covering in this project. Um, and, and wound up having to like do physical science and learn physical science. I also wound up like uh, interviewing and reading a lot of travel writing because it had to do with how we were going to pitch the topic. So I think you're absolutely spot on about that interdisciplinary approach. And I do think it, it, um, it makes the work better, but it also uh, sets the stage for the kinds of new discoveries that can change the field that you're talking about. I do see that as a good thing. Yeah, and, 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 and my, myself as a writer, I mean, the books I do attempt to try and capture something. So in order to understand a, a mindset of a, a commander, you, you can't just simply look at it in sense of war history. You have to say, what was his education? What was his perspective? And, and all these other things. And if you only say, um, look, look at the sort of the terms of the military history and, and you forget the rest, you don't understand the man. I think, I think the, the problem with pendulum shifting is obviously if, you, if you're swinging a pendulum and you're reacting to wherever the pendulum is on the left or the right, uh, if it's in the middle, it's very hard to shift. But the fact is that if, in order to react to that, you have to do an equal and opposite reaction in order for the pendulum middle ground to be in the new middle. When I think one of the things about the incremental history is it's trying to push a pendulum incrementally towards a new middle ground, whereas the the... Re, the, the violent reaction swings it so far the other way that the new middle ground will be further to left or right of where the original was. Um, and I think that the best work is the incremental work, but the most sensational Twitter-based, social media-based is the violent swing against. Yeah, the rewards. Look, I can say this. I was effectively a Twitter troll for years, you know, and I was, and I was rewarded with 20,000 followers and lots of attention from very famous people. And I can personally say I was incentivized. And when I look back on some of the things I said on Twitter back then, I, I want to crawl into a hole, I cringe. Um, and I, the only way I can sort of be compassionate with myself is like, look, man, you had a, you had a lot of powerful incentive. You know, I had very, very famous people, you know, liking my tweets and retweeting me and talking to me as a result of that. So I get it. I totally get it. But I do think that it, um, and again, I don't, I don't know that it's all bad because sometimes these revolutionary and bold uh, uh, positions do further what we know. Um, I just think it, I think it's here to stay though. I think it, it's, we're in a new world. I think, I think they can also work in the opposite way. When someone says something on Twitter in, in our field, which obviously is nowhere near as fraught with, with uh, you know, contemporary problems as other subjects on social media platforms, he says subtly, um, uh, it can actually make you go, no, you're wrong. And here's the reasons you're wrong. Um, and cement your opposition to that position. You know, here are the sources, here are the references to say you're wrong. Um, and not, not, 
my 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 lesson is to not engage on social media to go no they're wrong i've written up why they're wrong in a traditional this will be an article position and i'll never put it out there on twitter because i don't want to be you know receiving angry responses and reactions on twitter i think we're getting slightly distracted um because the original question was big you know for good or better or worse bigger bigly big um to stay discoveries um maybe maybe uh mark santis you look like you have uh, an idea in mind i i took this as i don't have something that was revolutionary but i think what i wanted to touch upon was several dawning realizations over the last uh say 20 years uh 21st century that i think will be of interest. Uh, the, the first is, uh, and, and they pertain to uh, Rome, the Roman military, and the, uh, the military history of the Roman Empire. Uh, the first is that the nature of Roman military equipment, uh, often we look at it and we say, oh, there's this linear progression from period to period, and they were first they were wearing the Monte Fortino caps, and then they switched to coolest, not for too long, and then they moved to the Imperial Italic and Imperial Gallic style helmets, and then they went to some other. And I believe that the heterogeneous nature of Roman military equipment, not merely over time, but within a particular period and across the length and breadth of the empire, is something that has become much more apparent to me uh, the more I research this, and that the, uh, the appearance of a Roman army uh, in any part of the empire at any one particular time would have been uh, I think much uh, much more diverse than perhaps the the images that we might see reproduced in art uh, or, or over the years previous has led us to believe, and so that that uh, a Roman legion would not have all of let's say the first century A.D. would not have all been marching into battle wearing some sort of a ter- imperial Gallic or imperial Italic style helmet with a scutum of you know identical uh, sh- size and shape that does not mean that there was not some degree of degree of uniformity i'm using that word advisedly but that the equipment itself uh would have would not have have matched i think what we would consider to be 20th century world war ii gi issue not with that relative regularity so that's the the first thing uh, second, I wanted to talk about the, the the realization of the impact of climate change on the Roman Empire and its role in the end of the Roman Empire, and that uh, the, the 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 height of the Roman Empire was reached in the second century A.D., and that came at the very end of what's now termed the Roman climate optimum, which it lasted from about 200 BC to 150 AD. And during that period, the uh, Mediterranean world uh, was was blessed by relatively warm, uh, wet, stable weather. That came to an end in the second century AD and things became progressively uh, drier, but also uh, much more varied. So you had more ups and downs in terms of the climate. And that meant that the, you know, food production was impacted. And of course, if food production is impacted, that also impacts the, uh, the, the population that you have. Uh, and all of that led to you, uh, what's now known as the, it's called the late Roman transition period, which went from about 150 to 450 AD. So as you can imagine, uh, that's when things start to go downhill for the Romans. Also, the Romans were necessarily part of a much larger world. And one of the things about the Roman Empire was that they were also vulnerable to diseases, pandemics. And we see that one of the first giant disease uh, outbreaks, the the, uh, Antonine Plague of 165 A.D., uh, now there had been uh, pandemics before, but this was enormous. And you have recurring outbreaks of pandemic disease in the Roman Empire uh, again and again. So the, the largest ones were the Antonine Plague of 165, and you also have the Plague of Cyprian of 251. Uh, probably most, you know, one of the most devastating was the Plague of Justinian of 541, which comes at the very end of our period. But I think that if we're going to be looking at what exactly happened to the Roman Empire later on, uh, we have to take into account uh, 
the impact of disease that, that reduced population. Uh, to just go back, uh, step back one moment, uh, I should also note that the Hunnic uh, invasion of the late fourth century AD uh, is now believed to have been uh, impelled by a severe drought on the steppe between sometime around 350 to 370 AD. So that's right around when the Huns started pushing westward, pushing the Goths into the Roman Empire. And then you have, you know, obviously the Goths moving into uh, Rome. Uh, you know, they fight the Battle of Adrianople, which was a, a devastating defeat for the Romans. And, uh, and, and lastly, I think that we should take into account between obviously diseases, climate change, the, just the economic immiseration of the Roman people. Uh, one thing that uh, I've wondered about for many years is how is it that the Romans were able to stand up to Hannibal after losing tens of thousands of, of men in an afternoon, say at Cannae, and just throw legion after legion to go fight the Carthaginians? How is it that several centuries later, even though the Roman Empire's population was much larger, they struggled to find an army to fight off Alaric and his Goths? And I believe that's because the the, the yeoman farmer that was the backbone of the Roman legions in the Republican period had disappeared and that uh, all of these uh, economic problems, the, the, the incentive to go fight for the fight for the Republic, fight for your home was not there. And I think that a lot of Romans had checked out on the empire by the end of the imperial period. And there you have it. You couldn't find enough people to go fight. Uh, all of these things are oversimplifications, by the way. Uh, any one of which could we could spend an hour on a topic, but I just thought those are the dawning realizations for me over the last twenty years. Cool, yeah, I think it's uh, but it, but it goes back to Mike's point. Um, you know, climate, um, the, the the research of you know uh, was it paleobiologists and um, and people who research ancient climate and stuff. That's that's certainly new, and that's providing totally new insight. That, um, that can help us explain things in our, that we find in text, which is yeah. I think it's always it's always very valid point. You get those sources that talk about the Balkans being empty. Um, you know, one of the reasons that the Goths come in and they ask for Thrace is because there's no one in Thrace. It's like, well, it's empty. Give it to us. You know, we'll be a bulwark against the Huns for you. Uh, and Valens says, okay. And you know, the the hindsight historians go, oh, well, he was foolish to do that. It's like, yeah, but you've got provinces empty really how wow what's going on and of course the ancients didn't have the um didn't have the understanding to know where that emptying had come from you know there's they talk about urbanization often that there were a lot of people fleeing to the cities which again is something that we've experienced in the 20th century uh and even in the 21st although weirdly over the last two years with the pandemic it's reversed there's been a fle fleeing in Australia, for instance, away from the cities. Um, and uh, I mean, well, I remember, so, you know, the, our, our 15 year uh, thing, when the 2004 tsunami hit, uh, you know, and it was one of the very first tsunamis to be in filmed massively in real time. One of the realizations uh, in the ancient military world was that Ammianus Marcellinus's description of uh, a tsunami in the Mediterranean was correct. That again, for all the things that he had said and described, weren't actually that far wrong uh, in terms of what was being seen in two thousand and four. So um, you know, it's not Herodotus being proved right, but it was it was one of those modern world, uh, you know, and even the, the recent Tongan volcano explosion being caught on satellite television, you know, that's theory. That's that's you, you're watching what. It may have looked like when the Mycenaean world collapsed, if you follow that theory. Because looking at that, you're like, yeah, that that had collapsed your world. So I think I find those sorts of insights from the modern world and you know modern understandings and new modern technologies are a fascinating lens through which to see the ancient world. And it will take a long time to apply them properly, but they 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 you know are exciting from an ancient perspective. Um, one. Uh one thing to add uh, that gives another example, and I think Lindsay actually brought this up from the example of teeth. There's an amazing scholar, Flint Dibble, really easy name to remember, Flint Dibble, and he's very active on Twitter. And he, uh, I believe he specializes entirely in animal teeth and animal bones from sacrifices and um, meal sites. And from this, he's able to determine from, uh, I believe, the contents of the bones, where the animals were grazed, what they ate. 
And that lets us know migration patterns, who was living where. Like it is also, he's, he's able to determine from the cuts what tools were used and then to tie that to the archaeological evidence to determine exactly, you know, what the, the, um, the cultural background of the people that were living in the area at the time. He's able to, he's able to get from this very quotidian find, you know, the remains in a refuse pit of animal bones that dogs have been gnawing on or something. And from this, just determine this absolutely incredible, turn it into the most incredible evidence I've ever seen. Um, and it's a great example of what we're describing. Uh, and an example of that that comes to mind, for example, at Stonehenge, they, they found piles of animal bones, uh, including pig bones, and they come from Scotland. These pigs were grazed in Scotland. So what the hell are they doing in Wiltshire? Yeah. <laughs> Welsh stone. That's right. Scottish but, but, pigs. Yeah. Well, but but the, but but isn't it interesting that you know it's something that you'd look in a museum case? Oh, it's pig bones next. Uh, there's a story in there. Yeah. I would, the, 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 the mobile nature of, of ancient peoples is becoming far far more clear, and has that that's one of the biggest developments, like you said, Mike, of the last fifteen or twenty years. It, it hasn't impacted ancient military history as much yet, I think, but uh, we may very well be wrong there. I think it's also one of those things that when those realizations come, the evidence has always been staring us in the face. Like the Bronze Age was like, right, well, where are you getting your tin from? Well, pretty much Cornwall. So there must have been vast amounts of tin coming out of Cornwall in the, in the ancient world. Have you seen the, the mine where it's, mm. it's 900 feet like, and it's hundreds of feet yeah. deep and it's a Bloody great big hole in the ground. It's huge. Yeah. So yeah. so when you get these when you get these new insights and people go, this was much more mobile, you're like, well, of course it must have been, because we had a whole age named after bronze, and the only way to make it was with stuff from Britain. Uh, you know, so I think and it's like, oh, of course, you know, face face palm moments of of course it's been staring us in the face for millennia and no one noticed. Technology will drive this change. I firmly believe this. And I'll give you one very concrete example that I think you'll probably agree with. So uh, Michael Livingston, who I've worked with on several articles for the magazine and who I'm um, hopefully going to be uh, doing this project with very shortly that I'll announce, he's a real uh, amazing conflict cartographer. He's one of the best battlefield analysts I've ever seen. And by that, I mean the physical battlefield. Um, and one of the things that he will often do when we're, when we're working is we'll sort of challenge the location of the battlefield, right? Well, we think it was here. And the one question we always come down to is, if this battle was truly here, we should find something when we dig. Or if, if it's where we think it is, we should find something where, where, when we dig. But digging, I mean, that's a really serious thing to do, right? You can't just go to Greece and go to Italy and dig, right? It's, it's a lot of money. Um, there's not a simple... But, I, but the day may come, and I think fairly soon, when I'll be able to fly a drone or run the equivalent of a Roomba over that field, and if there's stuff underneath it, even quite far down, I'll be able to find it. Um, and it will suddenly open up a chance to cheaply and quickly answer these kinds of questions and do these kinds of surveys. And obviously, the technology doesn't exist yet, but I think that that's not such a far-flung idea uh, that we might not see it in the next five, 10 years. And there's a legal headache from here to Tokyo. I was going to say, I don't think that's still going to solve the problem. The, the one that I was actually going to bring up tonight was actually saying, well, it, it might seem like it's, you know, it's not as, uh, you know, up to date, a, you know, revolutionary thing. But I think the most valuable information coming to us today is from a site like, you know, Vindolander Fort up in Hel um, Hadrian's Wall that you are still getting out of there such quality finds and that with the focus that is sort of i think it is the focus on the finds has changed over the last couple of decades in terms of actually looking at things in a much more personalized fashion the vindolander tablets are you know the perfect example of that microscopic view of looking at individuals from the past and you know they are the, the same effect of looking at Republican politics by going through Cicero's letters and saying, right, he gives us not just the insider's view, but he gives us the terminology. He gives us the insight. He gives us the feeling. And he gives us these tiny little snippets of, you know, going back to the Vindolanda tablets, you are getting somebody who's, you know, having an argument over, you borrowed my pruning shears. I would like them back, please. Um, I would like my beer ready when I get back. And of course, how many hops are going to be required? How, how much wheat is going to be required for our diet, including, of course, the beer? 
don't forget that. Um, you know, you, you've got these. Oh, these were Batavians, you know. I mean, well, at the same time, but we're arguing, you know, it's going to, it is opening up that debate as to, we traditionally have these identities of, you've mentioned the Batavians, we've got the Tungrians, um, we think we have these Even identities. more likely that one beer. Yeah, but we've, <laughs> but we've got these, you know, the more you look at the tablets, and of course these tablets, they started coming out of the ground in 1973, Um we are still getting tablets coming out of the ground every year. And some of the more recent ones, uh, some of the stuff that got published in 2019 was actually emphasizing that some of the, um, some of the nationalities that are actually making up these units, these are mixed units. They're not the, you know, the solid blocks of nationalities that maybe people have come to sort of expect by identities like Tungrians and Batavians. Um, You've got the you know the personalised details in terms of the names that are being that are coming out of these tablets, which again you can you know get the population that is actually in a military setting uh, like Hadrian's Wall, where are these individuals coming across coming from across the empire. You can also follow you know we're getting in uh, being able to follow individuals in their careers more and more, and the fact that this stuff keeps coming at us. I think, I, you know, it it gives you the personalised, you know, as much as we can say, you know, you can talk about these great theories in an, an overall perspective and whatnot and how we should treat them in history. I think at the same time, it's, you know, going with the modern take on history, you know, in whatever period you want to talk about, going to the personalised level is what's going to actually bring more people in. I think, you know, um, Guy, uh, what's his name? Guy, the... Uh, Bedoya um, brought out Gladius uh, book a couple of years ago now. And of course that was a great example of, you know, just taking snippets from every aspect of military history and bringing the personalized touch to it and saying, look at all these, you know, foibles that you're going to find across military life. Um, these are people and they, they stuff up and they're ordinary people and, you know, we don't want to, we're not interested in the, you know, necessarily all the time in the big individuals. Actually, it gives us better understanding of the military life and military capacity. It's like the incremental revolution. Um, you know, when the, when the toilet seat was discovered in 2014 at Vindalanda, you know, we've had, we've had marble stone toilet blocks, but never a, to- a wooden toilet seat, um, you know, and since... In the last 1900 years, the toilet seat design has not really developed much at all. Uh, you know, the Roman toilet seat is is identifiable as a toilet seat to, even to, to the 21st century person, which is fascinating. So, so what you're saying that that interpretation in the, the Hotel of the Mystery, the Motel of the Mysteries, is not right? Mm. <laughs> well, I, I have I have indeed. Uh, well, yeah, true. But see, that's that's many years into the future that the, oh, it right, may yeah. indeed it may indeed be a. Uh, uh, a ritual centre of the bathroom, and we pray at the great ceramic basin. Um, but uh, you know, very good. In which case, in which case, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. interpretation. Let me throw in my, my my big big sort of discovery. It, I it, was going to give it to you, Melinda. Yeah, so it, go ahead. archaeology, archaeology in Germany uh, it is kind of really uh, something that I've become much more aware of. And it, the, the part of the problem is, is that archaeology in Germany is in German which means that most English readers never know about it. Uh, in fact, one of the things I try to do, we try to do in the magazine, is bring those sort of discoveries to the English-speaking public. But uh, so, for example, um, in the 90s, uh, a place at Valgermus in the Land Valley was discovered, which in fact, it's an entrepot. You could argue it's a small trading post. But the thing is, it wasn't supposed to be there, that there was a conception that, well, the Romans you know, didn't do very much in Germany and so on, but, but we've got that. Uh, that. There are more and more forts being discovered uh, in the place. Of course, the famous battle site at Kalkrise, is, the, is that the Teutoburg? Nobody knows, really. Is it really just connected with Germanicus? Nobody knows, really. Um, and then there's a Hartshorn, for example, a, a, a third century battle site. And, and the fact is, the Romans keep going back to Germany. And, and, and it's amazing to me that archaeology is now beginning to find much more evidence of that contact. It was much more, I think, interlaced and intricate uh, than, than people probably think. And it's not really so much anymore a black and white story of Romans and barbarians uh, that, that some of the earlier history books may have. It, it's a much more nuanced uh, approach. There is interaction between people through trade and economics and so on and so forth. Um, and as a tangent to that, I wanted to, to pick out the particular discovery 
of a, a new kind of lorica, so-called segmentata, that was found just a couple of years ago in, in Calcrisa. And, and it points to a, a continuing improvement, if you want to use Six Sigma language, um, of, of, of taking an idea and perfecting it, optimizing it for, uh, for an application. And I, the one thing I've become aware of, I, I suppose, by seeing the Gulf War in modern times and the Iraq War in modern times is how troops modify stuff to best protect them in any particular situation. So someone, someone invented overlapping girdle plates and then had to come up with some sort of sh shoulder protection. And every reenactor will tell you, yes, it's overlapping plate, it's logo segmentata, and it's other core bridge or it's, it's uh, other kinds, right? Oh, that's exactly that's what I was looking for. <laughs> And now it turns out there's another kind that nobody ever imagined that would exist, which is basically like a single block that attaches to the shoulder. And, and it's fascinating to me because when you, when you do look to go back to Mike's point about social media, the, the way that people are absolutely uh, uh, strong in their opinions about uh, there are three things or two things. Or, and that archaeology has this wonderful way of upending those certainties by saying, actually, there's a fifth, sixth and seventh and there, there are variations. What it points to, we're, we're talking about individual craftsmen, probably armorers who are experimenting different parts of the world, and they probably have someone like the uh, the, 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 the Prefectus Castorum, for example, who's willing to let the guy have a go, well, make five and see how they work in the battlefield and come back and look at look at the, the results. And, and the fact that Calcrezia is a great site because it's producing those, it's battle context. It, it's extraordinary how it was found. I mean, this thing was, was discovered in the, in, in the ground. They literally cut a, a block of soil. I think it was like a meter by meter square. And they weren't quite sure what this thing was. And they send it off to, I think it's one of the great institutes in, in uh, Fraunhofer or something in Germany. Uh, and they're subjected to CT scanning and they can't really believe what they've got in this thing. And they're in the process of conserving it. Um, but what I think, what, what I'm trying to say is archaeology is, is, is amazing because it keeps throwing up things we least expect. And I think the other thing is also it points that you can't believe everything you read in the history books simply because, as a remark I made earlier, is the history is not complete. Um, if a historian says, and many wars occurred in this year, and I'm not going to dis discuss them, then we don't know what they are. And, and, and I, when, when people seem to think that they know all of history, they can't, because we can't know all of history. And it's, it's, it's the great wonder. And I think the reason why we're in the business of writing about it, because there's always something new to discover. Go ahead, Mike. I was going to say... I just love this point. Uh, but go ahead, Jasper. I talk too damn much. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that Lindsay just perfectly, you know, completed the circle that Murray started with, you know, Herodotus gets confirmed sometimes. And here goes Lindsay. Yeah, but sometimes... So, you know, and it, it's maybe a slight, this is, ended up being a slightly more philosophical episode about big discoveries and incremental change. Well, that's important. That's valuable. That's very valuable. And I, well, think it I hope it was your... enjoyable anyway. And I want to thank you all for your contributions. Yes, because we have oh. more episodes coming, Mary. You know, don't worry about it. Oh, let's do it all in one well, a year. Plus AWA, 52 episodes a year. People will hear, get enough of us. <laughs> no, they can never hear too much of me. That's what I say. Oh, no, that's true. That's, that's, that's why that's <laughs> your, your, your byline in the magazine. Uh, <laughs> thank you all very much. We'll see you again soon.